Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for the invitation to be here this evening and for hosting me uh, today and during my time here in Japan. Uh, during my time working at the Center for New American Security, I've had the privilege of working with a number of the experts uh, from Sasakawa, and uh, we very much benefited from the exchanges that we've been able to have uh, with them. And so it's a privilege today to be here in the headquarters of Sasakawa Peace Foundation and to be able to uh, address the audience here. The topic of my talk today is U.S.-Japan relations in a changing Asia, or as I'll refer to it this evening, uh, the Indo-Pacific, which I think um, are generally interchangeable terms, but as I'll describe in just a minute, um, have a certain nuance that is shaping the way individuals who make policy in Washington, at least, are thinking about the region that we're in today. Um, and so what I wanted to do today is address both the parts of the title in reverse order. So first, I'm going to offer um, a few points, seven points, um, that in my view capture the most dynamic uh, regional trends in Asia and thereby that f affect the future course of Japan, the United States, and the alliance. And then I'll turn to how this combination of factors is likely to affect relations between our two countries and, and where I believe we go from here. But first, let me state my overall view of U.S.-Japan relations. A forthcoming report, uh, in fact, that will be released later this week from uh, Ambassador Richard Armitage and Professor Joseph Nye. Uh, this will be the fourth in the series of so-called Armitage Nye reports to be released. The title of that report is More Important Than Ever, uh, in which they refer to the U.S.-Japan uh, US -Japan alliance. And that sums up where I come from as well. Uh, close ties between Tokyo and Washington have always been critical to stabilizing East Asia from resisting Soviet expansionism during the Cold War to uh, aiding the growth of regional and global prosperity, dealing with security threats in other parts of the world, uh, and supporting the expansion of democracy and liberal values. And I would say that the Alliance's track record over the years has been one of significant success. But for all its importance in the past, I believe that today it's more critical than ever that the United States uh, and Japan work closely together uh, given the array of challenges in this region and beyond. And just why that's the case, I think is best understood against the backdrop of the changes that are taking place right now in the Indo-Pacific region. So, let me turn to uh, the seven ways in which it seems to me the region where we're standing, or sitting as the case may be today, uh, is different than it was yesterday. And in fact, will be uh, transformed even more tomorrow. So the first observation I would offer stems from the nomenclature that I just used, and which has been adopted by Australia and India and much of Washington, that is, the Indo-Pacific, uh, the notion of an integrated strategic theater that joins the Indian and Pacific Ocean areas started, of course, in Tokyo. Um, but the concept has really caught on. And the Trump administration, unlike its predecessor in the Obama administration that sought to rebalance to Asia, uh, now pursues a policy of a free and open Indo-Pacific. U.S. Pacific Command, which is based in Hawaii, uh, recently changed its name to U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Prime Minister Modi uh, has articulated an ambitious Indian role in this contiguous region, and uh, successive Australian prime ministers um, have done the same. Uh, and, you know, you can always ask what's in a name. Is it meaningful to change the name from Pacific Command to Indo-Pacific Command to refer to something as the Indo-Pacific instead of Asia? Um, and of course, some of this is symbolic and rhetorical, but beyond or behind the rhetorical shift um, is a conceptual move that indicates the more integrated way in which American policymakers, at least, tend to think about the strategic challenge in Asia. They're viewing China's rise not only as an East Asian phenomenon or a maritime phenomenon, uh, but one that crosses two oceans, impacts dozens of countries, and exists in multiple domains. 
And by continually inviting India into the group of democratic great powers hoping to shape China's course, Japanese and American leaders have opened new avenues for collaboration into the future. This is evident um, for starters in the growing ties between uh, Tokyo and New Delhi uh, and Tokyo's increased in interest in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and of course, the story of US-India ties and their transformation from a period of estrangement to a, a period of, uh, of strategic partnership um, has been going on for some two decades, a rare example of sustained bipartisan foreign policy effort. And so um, the point here is that the, new, the nomenclature, the term Indo-Pacific, uh, marks a, a conceptual shift in the minds of a lot of policymakers, certainly in Washington, but elsewhere as well, in which we are starting to think uh, more holistically about this integrated strategic theater that spans two oceans. The second observation I'd offer is about the changing, about ch the changing into Pacific stems from the speed and the ambition of China's regional influence. So I'd ask you to consider a few metrics here. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that China touts so often and which has garnered so much conversation uh, among um, policymakers uh, on both sides of the Pacific um, measures, their investments measure in at least a trillion dollars, maybe more than that, depends on what the latest figure you believe is, but let's say a lot. Uh, the Chinese economy is projected to overtake um, America's at some point in the next few years, and its share of global GDP is set to grow. Now, of course, you have to be careful about straight line projections of economic growth for anybody, and particularly for China. Um, there's some, uh, some negative uh, sides that one sees. So, for example, in 2018, the number of workers in China declined absolutely for the first time in, in five decades. Um, bad investments like Belt and Road sometimes leads to can be the downside of uh, an ambitious investment and uh, set of priorities um, if the beneficiaries can't repay their loans and that could put a drag on economic growth. But certainly the amount of resources China has available at its disposal and that Beijing's leaders believe they have at their disposal to achieve their foreign policy ambitions is currently very large. In the military dimension, China now has the world's largest navy, so it's bigger than the US Navy, uh, which was not the case just a couple of years ago. It's built its first domestically produced aircraft carrier. Its pace of production of submarines and other vessels is breathtaking, I think, and its investments in anti-access area denial capabilities threaten many of the traditional American military strategies that have relied on air and sea-based platforms within range to, of China to carry out operations. Um, the Chinese defense budget is currently less than half that of the United States, but it's focused on one region, this Indo-Pacific region, whereas the United States has global deployments and global responsibilities. And then consider technology acquisition. China today is focused on dominating the new commanding heights, as some have referred to them, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, quantum computing. And indeed, the Pentagon recently, uh, or earlier this year, released a national defense strategy, which emphasized the primacy of great power competition uh, to the way in which our de defense um, leadership is thinking about the challenges to American national security. Um, in the defense, uh, national defense strategy, uh, the authors note that the United States has and continues to enjoy an advantage in military technology that w remains the most salient factor in defending against, deterring, and if necessary, defeating great power uh, competitors or adversaries, um, but also that that gap is growing. Uh, I'm sorry, that the gap is shrinking uh, between the United States and China. Um, we could go on with other metrics about China, um, but the point here is that the driver of many of the military and the diplomatic and the economic moves made by China's neighbors across the region, and actually some of the opportunities it creates for the United States and Japan, um, are responses to precisely the kinds of moves and metrics that I just mentioned. Third observation is about the continued threat posed by North Korea. 
Sometimes it's hard to remember that just a few months ago, many observers were, produ were predicting a second Korean War uh, with Japan at risk and the United States preparing for brutal extended fighting on the peninsula. Uh, the drama of uh, President Trump's Singapore meeting with Kim Jong-un, and if you saw any uh, tweets or news today, he uh, announced that he is in love with Kim Jong-un. Um, uh, so the, the, it, let's just say the, the ground has shifted rather dramatically, rather quickly, um, not to mention President Moon's subsequent diplomacy. Um, and so now all of our minds are focused on what the contours of de a denuclearization deal might look like, what might the timeline be for such a deal, uh, what kind of verification and compliance would be necessary to ensure such a deal, um, how might North Korea enter the community of civilized and prosperous nations. Um, and so we all hope that there's a positive outcome to this round of very ambitious diplomacy. And I hope too, and I believe that it's worth testing the hypothesis that Pyongyang is actually serious about giving up its nuclear weapons and its missiles and changing its belligerent external character, um, and even possibly changing the nature of its repressive rule at home. Um, but frankly, I remain very skeptical uh, that the current diplomatic process will end in success. I hope it does, but I think that the chances, unfortunately, uh, remain quite um, considerably against it. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves that the chief metric of, pro of progress in this has to be the dismantlement or the surrendering of North Korean nuclear weapons. And of course, we haven't seen any hint of that thus far, and by all accounts, they're actually increasing the number of nuclear weapons rather than decreasing it. Um, and so if my skepticism is justified, and if the hope just remains hope, then the situation in Northeast Asia at some point could change quite rapidly back to a war footing or to at least, uh, you know, uh, hostility between the parties. Um, and this could mean North Korean missile and nuclear tests, um, belligerent rhetoric from both Pyongyang and Washington. Uh, and then we would return to the debates about the degree to which the North can be deterred from attacks and from proliferating nuclear materials and, and technology and worries about the decoupling of the United States from its allies um, in Japan and South Korea. The fourth phenomenon that I would like to highlight is uh, a response by the non-China countries across the Indo-Pacific to strengthen security ties uh, with one another outside of the formal treaty networks, outside of the five uh, treaty networks that the United States has in the so-called hub and spoke system. And this is something that my colleagues and I have written about this referred to as Asia security networking. Um, this um, phenomenon in which uh, non-allies are strengthening ties with each other, bilaterally, sometimes uh, trilaterally or multilaterally. Um, and this network that's emerged over the past five or seven years and that is really gathering steam features Japan as a node in the north and Australia as another one in the south. Um, both of those countries have increased defense ties uh, with one another and with other capable states like India and Singapore and Vietnam and the Philippines and others. And in fact, Tokyo has been at the forefront of this effort, striking strategic partnership agreements with multiple countries, uh, conducting joint naval and air exercises, engaging in military exchanges, exploring weapon sales and joint production and increasing its information exchanges. And this security network, this Asian security network is being driven uh, by worries about China's capabilities and future intentions in the first instance. But I also think it's driven to some degree by concern about whether the United States can and will uh, remain militarily and economically engaged in Asia. Um, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that in just a minute. Um, but when layered on top of the alliance system rather than a replacement for it, um, the emerging network is a good thing. It's good for the United States, it's good for Japan, good for the countries of the region. It helps to ensure that China's continued emergence as a strong power um, is taking place where many of the like-minded countries are growing stronger themselves and they're working together in ways they had not before. Um, and this is something that Washington and Tokyo 
uh, have and should continue uh, to encourage um, uh, throughout the region to deepen those efforts, to multilateralize those efforts, and so on. The fifth area that I would highlight um, is related specifically to the American role in the region and the degree to which it has and, and may continue to change. And here I think the story is quite honestly quite mixed. The Trump administration, as distinguished from the president himself, um, generally takes the Indo-Pacific region very seriously, um, pledging deeper engagement, fleshing out this notion of a free and open Indo-Pacific region in which countries are free from coercion, that they have the ability to have open trade and investment, um, that democracy and the rule of law can take root, um, and, and that uh, the rules-based regional order uh, is, is held intact. And in that sense, you see the similarities here in that approach um, and the emphasis on the region in documents like the administration's national security strategy and the national defense strategy, um, in the Secretary of State's efforts to launch a regional infrastructure initiative, um, the Secretary of Defense stress on the need to compete for new allies and partners. One sees it also in the skepticism with which the administration views China's One Belt, One Road uh, and digital Silk Road initiatives, their resistance to Chinese efforts to influence the domestic politics of other countries, uh, and the general awareness of the administration of the need to push back against Chinese regional designs in order to ensure, in fact, this freer and more open Indo-Pacific. Um, and all of those initiatives and all of those activities and are, are taking place uh, in the administration. But it's important to note that the president himself, President Trump himself, has articulated a different set of priorities, generally speaking. Um, for the president, the Indo-Pacific agenda appears to feature three issues above all. The threat of North Korea, trade deficits, especially with not only with respect to China, and the financial implications of defense decisions, whether it's um, allied burden sharing, uh, the cost of what he calls war games on the Korean Peninsula, which are the joint exercises the United States in, is engaged with in South Korea, um, the cost of troop deployments, and the encouragement of our allies and friends uh, to buy American weapons. And so this has led some people to argue that, in fact, the Trump administration has two policies toward Asia, President Trump's and the administration's. And then at some point, one of them will have to fall away. Something will have to give in this kind of collision. Um, I think the lesson of politics in Washington over the past couple of years is that um, things we thought were unsustainable are sustained on a daily basis. Uh, and so I can well imagine uh, the president and his team both pursuing both agendas simultaneously, even though sometimes they're in conflict with each other. The sixth factor uh, in the regional story is how Japan's responded to all this. Um, consider the economic affront. Uh, once the United States withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, Prime Minister Abe took on some of the mantle of trade liberalization uh, and won approval for an agreement that leaves the United States out. Uh, the trade leadership and his ability to balance competing imperatives is now going to be put to the test because the Prime Minister will be um, faced with conducting bilateral trade negotiations with the United States, bringing RCEP to completion, uh, implementing both the TPP and the Japan EU free trade agreement, uh, and doing it all kind of at the same time. This is no easy task, but I have to say it's encouraging to see uh, Japanese leadership behind uh, economic liberalization at a moment when the United States is going through uh, one of its periodic uh, protectionist phases here. On the defense front, uh, the next couple of years, I think, may be even more consequential for Japan uh, than the last. I won't go into this too much because I'm sure this audience knows this uh, better than I do, but over the next three years, we may see movement toward uh, the reinterpretation, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the amendment of Japan's constitution under Article 9, uh, following the reinterpretation uh, that permits uh, collective self-defense, um, more steps toward the security networking that I described before in military diplomacy, um, more steps toward uh, weapons production for the export market, um, the acquisition of offensive strike capabilities uh, when it comes to 
uh, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and other things that could hold at risk um, assets in North Korea, if not in other places. Um, and uh, then the overall question about uh, whether Japan will count indefinitely on American protection and extended deterrence and the relationship between um, its concerns or uh, solace there and the size of its defense budget. So there's big and, and complicated questions, and I hope that those are being and will be addressed uh, in the context of the alliance. My seventh and final observation about changes in the Indo-Pacific turns directly on politics in the United States and how the American people feel about their traditional role in the world. Uh, for decades, there were three broad areas of consensus that guided both Democratic and Republican administrations in their foreign policy approach, each one of which was a direct outgrowth of lessons learned at quite terrible cost in the first half of the 20th century. The first of these kind of consensus principles was to maintain the peace, the United States would have strong alliances in Europe and Asia undergirded by the forward deployment uh, of American troops that would be there on an indefinite basis. The second is to increase prosperity, the United States would favor an open international economic system uh, that is built on progressively freer trade and investment. And then the third was to protect our values at home and abroad, the United States would, when possible, favored democracies over autocratic systems. And pretty much the debate over the years between Republicans and Democrats, between conservatives and liberals, uh, was largely one of how to operationalize each of these principles rather than over the principles themselves. How big a military do we need to do these things, to maintain the peace? How many troops abroad? Uh, what exceptions should there be uh, in the general march toward free trade? Uh, what do you do about those who are on the losing side of globalization? Uh, when is it better to side with a friendly autocrat rather than a hostile but democratically elected regime? These were the kinds of questions that really animated the foreign policy uh, makers on both sides. Um, and they're all difficult questions and they're ones that never went away. But again, it was about how to do these things rather than a debate over the broadest goals of American engagement in the world. The United States and its allies had built, most people thought, a rules-based and liberal international order that for all of its flaws was better than any of the alternatives, and so it was worth defending and extending. President Trump, again, as distinguished from many in his own administration, seems to have a quite different view about how good all of this has actually been for the American people. Um, in some of his words, the prevailing international order hasn't been a net benefit for Americans, but in some instances, a net cost. Um, it's allowed our allies to grow rich under U.S. protection. Uh, it eviscerated our manufacturing base and our working class. Uh, it resulted in Washington poking its nose into internal squabbles around the world, uh, often at great expense in lives and treasure. Um, perhaps then better to recognize that the world is fundamentally zero sum, even with allies and even with trade partners, build strong fences, um, recoup the losses that we've made over the past decades, and mind more of our own business. Now that's a very simplified description of Trumpism, if such a thing actually exists. Um, and the administration's philosophy and, and its policy could be a subject of a seminar all its own. Uh, but my point is this, the overall tendency I just described is not limited to just President Trump, uh, but it's a sentiment shared to varying degrees by a significant section of the American population. Um, I think we saw foresha this foreshadowed to some degree during the eight years of President Obama. It's obviously taken a different turn uh, and a deeper turn under President Bush, I'm sorry, President Trump. Um, and, and, and where we go from here is quite uncertain. I think the only, un the only certainty about it is that this tendency is bound to continue to shape America's engagement in the Indo-Pacific region and thereby Japan's place in it as well. So the seven points that I've laid out here uh, attempt to make some sense of the regional dynamics at work today and suggest where things may be headed in the near future. 
for all of the uncertainty, I believe that the implications for U.S.-Japan relations are actually quite straightforward. In almost any conceivable regional scenario, both of our countries will do better when they're stronger and better when they're working closely together rather than weaker or working further apart. This is true militarily, it's true diplomatically, and it's true economically. We'll weather threats better together and we'll deal, deal with our periodic politi political dysfunctions better by remaining close. Uh, we can seize economic opportunities by sketching out a shared agenda we can defend our democratic values when we align our efforts. We're better Americans in the world, and I would submit better Japanese in the world when we're pursuing common endeavors rather than separate ones, and we will be more successful in our attempts to do so. There's a lot of specific work uh, necessary to operationalize closer U.S.-Japan cooperation, given all the changes that I was talking about um, across multiple spheres, and perhaps following these remarks, we could talk a little bit about some of those specific ways in which this could be done. But let me just conclude by returning to the fundamental understanding uh, that I mentioned, and which I think is the good news of U.S.-Japan relations. I arrived uh, here uh, from Washington um, just uh, before the typhoon set in, and uh, so I, I made it in, but that was uh, just yesterday and quite recently, and I can attest that in Washington, having just got off the plane, at some level, everybody gets it. They, they get the commonality of interests and values between the United States and Japan, the sound strategic logic of our alliance, um, and the fact that um, that logic exists really does permeate down into nearly every one of the decisions uh, that our political and policy leaders make. It's one reason why our military officers so value their work with the self-defense forces, why there's such support for the alliance and the Congress. I think it's one reason why President Trump has spent more time and spoken more often to Prime Minister Abe than to any other world leader. And it's why I personally am optimistic about the future of U.S.-Japan relations, relations, even in a region and in a world that is changing rapidly around us. Thank you very much. はい、えー、それではあのよろしくお願いいたします、えー、杉田と申します、えー、フォンテンさんのスピーチは本当にあの包括的で,でですね、えー、同時に一つ一つのポイントについて非常にあの具体的にあのお,お考えを説明していただきました、えー、特にやっぱりいろいろ我々あの北朝鮮情勢や中国の問題あるいはあの日本がですね、えー、今あ今後23年大変重要な時期を迎えるというようなご指摘あるいはですねアメリカがトランピズムなるものが今後意外な広がりを持っているんじゃないかというような指摘非常に資産に富むお話をたくさんいただきましたそれではまずですねこのフォンテンさんのですねスピーチに対してですね佐橋先生からですね、あのコメントをいただきたいと思います。佐橋先生はあのまあ経営のアメリカ外交の研究者ということですので、日本側の考えている立場をですねぶつけていただきたいと思います。それではよろしくお願いします。ありがとうございます。あの最初にあの本店氏非常に素晴らしいあの洞察にあふれたあのスピーチありがとうございました。また笹川平和財団の皆様にはあの本日お招きいただきましてありがとうございます。えー、本店さんの講演を振り返るとですね、七つのまあポイントオブザベーションがあるというふうにあのおっしゃっていました。まあここですべてを振り返ることはいたしませんが、本店理事長はですね、まあインド太平洋という戦略概念がまあ非常に強く。えーまあ、今広がってきてきいるそしてアメリカ政府もそれを十分に評価するようになったということそして中国のですねさまざ、あ、まな意味での影響力というものが政治軍事さらには技術の面で強まっているということその上でですねそういったことに対応するアメリカの政策というものは政府と大統領の間でどうも断層があるようだと2つのアジア政策という言葉も申しあのおっしゃっておりました。異なった優先順位を持つ政権と大統領とそのせめぎ合いの中でアメリカの政策はあるんだというふうに強調されたと思います
そしてその上で最後にですねアメリカ外交というのはこれまでは平和の維持繁栄の維持価値観の擁護こういったものを重要視してきてそこには程度の差こそあれコンセンサスがあったけれどもしかしですね今のトランプ政権というものはそういったものをどうもあまり重要視してないのではないかとその上でですねそのトランプの考え方に共鳴する人もアメリカの中では増えていると、まあ、そのような形でお話をしていただいたというふうに思います。まあ、このように伺うとですね非常にこうトランプ外交というものを立体的に構造的に理解する補助線を引いていただけたのかな,いた,だけたのかなと私は非常に感謝申し上げております。で日本の観点からこれから数分間だけコメントを差し上げますと、まあ、本店主の講演にはですねグッドニュース明るいニュースもですねバッドニュースも両方とも含まれていたというふうに思います日本の利益に対してですね。しかしですね私は本来本質的に極めてペシミズムの人間でございまして本店主の、まあえー、バッドニュースにも満足しておりません私はもっと暗い見通しを持つべきではないのかというふうに思っておりまして、えー、今日はその観点からコメントを申し上げたいと思います。第1にですね、えー、本店主は、まあ、アメリカがインド太平洋戦略を打ち出してそして中国が投げかけているです、ね、戦略的な調整に対応しようとしているというふうにご説明されていました確かにナショナルセキュリティストラテジー国家安全保障戦略やナショナルディフェンスストラテジーあの国家防衛戦略または最近のマティスポンペイオさんたちが演説している内容を見ても私たちもです、ね、若干安心できるところはありますしかしですねおっしゃったように2つのアジア政策がある中でまたは外交政策全般を見てもトランプ政権はですね2つの方向性に引き裂かれていることは変わりないそしてアメリカファーストという方針またはですね秩序国際秩序やグローバリズムに対する敵意から生み出されている外交政策の方向性は依然として強いのではないかというふうに思うわけです。例えば中国政策を見たときになぜか今はその両者が奇妙に結びついているそして非常に強硬な中国政策になっているんだと思いますしかしですねトランプ大統領とそれを支える経済ナショナリストまたはアメリカファーストゼロサム的なですね先生がおっしゃったようにゼロサム的な世界観を持つ人たちは結局は強いのではないのかというふうなことを私たちは恐れているわけですどういうことかと言いますと先ほど本店主はその2つのアジア政策がせめぎ合っていると説明されましたけれども私たちはいやそうではなくて大統領ないしアメリカファーストの考え方がやはり結局常にアッパーハンド上手を取っているのではないかというふうに考えるわけです。そう考えますと今先生がご説明されたようなですねインド太平洋戦略軍とか官僚が考えているものは持続可能なのかというとおそらく持続可能ではないのではないのかとそして結局はですねインド太平洋政策というものはアメリカファーストに回収されてしまうではないのかとこれが一つ目のコメントであり質問です。そしてですね結局は秩序も安全保障もさして気にしないトランプ大統領の考え方は中国とのビッグディールさえ生んでしまうんじゃないかそういうことを私は大変危惧しております第2にですねだからこそ本店主もアメリカが十分に力を発揮できないということを分かっているからこそ日本やインドオーストラリアに対する希望を述べられたのだと思いますしかし国際政治学者として私が問いたいのは果たしてアメリカ以外の国がどれほど連携してもバランスオパワーを十分に高めるることができるんだろうか私の答えはおそらくそれはないということですいくら日本がオーストラリアが努力をしたとしても経済的な見通しさらにそこから生み出される軍事予算技術を考えても所詮はアメリカを埋められるほどのものにはならないのではないのかインドは確かに大きな希望です軍事予算も経済的な見込みも非常に高いしかしインドは全くもって私たちの希望通りには動いていないインドと中国の関係を見たところでですね私たちは全くそのような楽観を持つことができないわけですそう考えますとあの私たちはですねバランスオーパワーという観点から結局はアメリカが帰ってくることを待つしかないのではないのかと果たしてセキュリティネットワークの意味はどこにあるのかとそういうふうに思うわけですですのであの
まあ、結局は私たちのできることにそこまで期待されてもというところがありますしやはりアメリカの国際主義こそが重要なのではないのかと思うことです。簡単にあと2つぐらいだけ挙げます。3つ目がですねトランプ本店先生本店理事長はですねトランプ氏はトランプ政権を超えて国民からの支持があると。そういった内向きな外交姿勢に支持があるというふうにお話になりました2020年の大統領選挙で果たしてそれはどういう形で議論されてくるのかこれは簡単にご質問を差し上げたいと思います4つ目にですね北朝鮮問題です私もおおむね同意していますがただこの地域で存在している懸念は米朝交渉が破綻するという本店先生が理事長がおっしゃったことではなくて米朝交渉がどんどん進んでしまってこの地域の安全保障環境が根本から変わってしまうということのリスクではないかというふうに思います。最後にですけれども米中競争非常に今高まっておりますこういった中でですねこれはちょっとトリビアルな質問かもしれませんがもうさまざまな経済技術安全保障ここに加えて今月今10月ですから先月からウイグルや台湾といった問題がとにかく登場してくるようになりました果たしてちょっとこれは本当に細かい質問なんですけれどもあのこういったウイグルや台湾という新しいファクターというものはトランプ政権のアジア太平洋インド太平洋戦略や対中関係にどのような影響を持ってくるのか。政権はそれをどのように唱えるのかトランプ大統領はどのように唱えるのかということについてお伺いできればと思います長々と失礼いたしましたはい、えー、沢橋先生ありがとうございました沢橋先生のあのご指摘及び質問も大変あの包括的で、えー、我々が聞きたいポイントが網羅されているように感じましたけれども、えー、フォンテンさんあの大体五点ですかね沢橋先生指摘されましたけれども、えー、質問という形ですあのお答えをお願いしたいと思います。Okay, I'm ready.、Um, you are pessimistic. <laughs>、um, let me try to take、uh, each of these in term here, turn here.、Um, the first one was whether the Indo-Pacific strategy is going to be absorbed into a more economic nationalist approach, the kind of America first approach. And to some degree, I think the answer is yes. The Indo, you know, if you could step back from it, those who are pushing a more robust approach in the Pacific would say, well, let's have a multilateral trade agreement like the TPP. The president obviously had a different view. Well, who wins? The president wins on that one.、Um, and so when you're talking about the economic side of this,、um, I think the answer is yes. The one thing I would say, however, is that it's not clear to me how significant the changes are going to be、um, in practice. So, you know, the, the, the economic nationalist, so to speak, the president demanded a renegotiation of the Korea US free trade agreement. And, It, the changes that were actually made were not that great.、Um, he threatened to pull out of the North America Free Trade Agreement and then got a bilateral deal with Mexico that doesn't change all that much and you know, doesn't like TPP, but now we're in a bilateral、uh, set of trade talks with Japan, and Japan is already, at least on agriculture, sort of embracing the TPP. Um, ceiling for what it would do on market access. So, what it actually means in practice, I think, kind of remains to be seen when it comes to this America first approach to economics. On the balance of power, just let me clarify my, my position here. So, what I'm not suggesting is that Japan and India and Australia all added together somehow fills a gap left by the United States. I think the United States has got to be present in the region. My, what I'm suggesting is that the United States and Japan and India and Australia together can balance rising Chinese power、um, rather than they try to fill a gap that's left by the United States.、Um, and in that sense, the security networking can be very significant, but it requires an engaged United States. And there I'm less pessimistic, I think, than you,、um, because if you look over both the Obama and the Trump administrations, Um, you know, the, the security engagement of the United States and Asia has gone up, not down. I mean, there were the various things that the Obama administration did、uh, with Vietnam and Singapore and Australia and India. The Trump administration has significantly increased the defense budget. It's going to increase the size of the US Navy. This gives us 
more resources to work with rather than less. Um, and so I, I don't see an America that's militarily disengaged um, from the Indo-Pacific region. Um, 2020, uh, what do we expect? It's hard enough to predict 2016 and it already happened. Uh, so I don't, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine 2020, but uh, I think there's some chance that uh, a Democratic candidate will run against President Trump on a theme of American renewal framing this around China, saying, you know, the, the Chinese would like to dominate in areas like artificial intelligence and quantum computing and, and biotechnology, and the, and the president uh, focuses on, you know, things like coal and steel and, and aluminum and, and things like that. And in fact, what we need is an American renewal that would allow us to better compete uh, in a world where the Chinese uh, are, are powerful. Whether that will actually happen and be a theme in the 2020 election, I don't know. Uh, but I think it's uh, I think it's possible. Um, your worries about a bad deal with North Korea, I agree. Uh, you could you could be worried about a bad deal with North Korea. Um, and then finally, uh, this question of you know how did the Chi how did the human rights and democracy uh, agenda play into China policy? And the answer is not a whole lot, honestly. Um, you know, President Obama uh, compared to. George W. Bush put much less priority on the promotion of democracy and human rights. Uh, in general, after the Arab Spring, he put less still, uh, and I think President Trump puts less still. Uh, he seems not to be um, typically troubled by uh, friendly relations with dictators and autocrats, uh, and the promotion of our democratic and, and values and human rights, with some exceptions, Cuba, Venezuela. Um, just really isn't a, a big foreign policy priority at the moment. Uh, and with China, it seems clear that the administration's, um, you know, the president's top priority is economic. And then there's, you know, the administration has other priorities after that, including South China Sea and, and uh, cyber uh, domain and things like that. あ、すみません。あの、皆さんの質問を多分今杉田さんが読まれるので、その前に1つだけ簡単にすみません、英語で。So just a quick question um, about the role of Japan. Because yeah, I mean, I also I agree with you your point. I mean, Japan, Australia, India cannot make military balance, a balance of power against China. And uh, maybe you emphasize on kind of more diplomatic uh, role of Japan or a kind of more soft softer power of Japan, uh, you know, could shape the region regional security landscape uh, in a very good way. But still, um, we, yeah, I mean, I agree, you know, Japan still have a lot, lot to do, you know, in diplomatic activities uh, to shape China and Chinese behavior. But also, I wonder, what is the role of Japan's SDF future, in the future with United States? And what kind of law you expect uh, US-Japan military alliance aspect uh, to, to shape Chinese activities beyond Japan, national, Japanese territory, you know, maybe including more wider Indo-Pacific area. So what kind of role Japan and Japan-US military alliance should play there? I think the first point to observe is that of America's allies uh, in the Indo-Pacific, Japan is by far the most militarily capable of, of any of them. Um, I mean, for example, we like to sort of talk about Japan and Australia in the same kind of bucket. They're not in the same bucket in terms of military capability. Japan is far more capable uh, than Australia uh, in, in a number of respects. I think, you know, how active the self-defense forces are going to be outside the home islands ultimately is going to be a question for the Japanese people to determine. However, there's a lot going on already. If you look at Japanese uh, at SDF um, uh, port visits in, in Vietnam or trilateral um, exercises with the United States and India and the Malabar exercises that take place each year uh, or um, the provision of, uh, of vessels to the Philippines, for example, uh, for maritime security, maritime domain awareness purposes. Um, you know, so each of these things is n maybe not uh, tremendous on its own, but when you add it together, it's a picture of self-defense forces that are more active throughout um, a much bigger uh, amount of geography than was the case, you know, a few years ago. And from an American perspective, the more Japan um, does of that kind of activity, the better.
。はい、あの今日は、えー、早くもたくさんの方から質問をいただいてますので、えー、これを整理してですね、えー、どんどんあの本店さんに、えー、ぶつけて答えて、えー、をいただきたいと思うんですけど、まずあの中国ですね、米中関係、えー、これなんですけれども。つまりその貿易の赤字の問題を超えて、えー、あのまあ技術の問題、えー、技術ですね、えー、あるいは軍事的な、えー、問題などを見ますと、えー、新しい冷戦のようなですねそういうような評価が、えー、されているのではないかとアメリカでですね。えーこ,のこういった見方についてでその結果もし冷戦であるならばそれは大変こう深刻な対立が長く続くということだと思うんですけどもその辺の見通しですねそれから、まあ、貿易についてはまあこれはまあトランプさんの考えが誰もわからないわけですけれども米中の貿易の、まあ、貿易戦争をというものがアメリカにおいてはどのように受け止められているのかということですね。この辺をまずお願いしたいと思います。そうです。notion of a new cold war with China。I think that's the wrong way to think about it。and the reason is because the cold war between the United States and the Soviet Union was essentially geographically Demarcated, there literally was a line through Europe. There were countries that were communists and there were countries that were not in Southeast Asia and Africa and everywhere else. And the goal of the United States、uh, and its allies and friends was to prevent the expansion of communism and to contain it. And in the context of that, there were two blocks there was the Soviet bloc and the Warsaw Pact and all of these things, and of course, you know, the, the US and, and the sort of free world. And there was very little economic interaction between the two sides. Most of those factors are not really present now. One, there's tremendous economic interaction between the United States and China, and that gives us a, multi, a, a mutual dependence、um, that did not exist between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Um, secondly, there's not really two blocks. I mean, the United States and has allies all over the world. Who are China's allies? Well, maybe North Korea, maybe Cambodia.、Um, but it, there's not a Chinese block, certainly in the same way militarily.、Um, and so the, the harder part about, in a way, it's more complicated and harder than it, than it was during the Cold War because in the Cold War, there was them and there was us. And we traded with us, and we had allies among us, and they did the same thing with them. Now we trade and have investment with China, and so do all of our friends and allies.、Uh, we're, we're in many of the same places. So it's not a question only of、uh, confrontation or even only of competition, it's also of Mutual dependence and navigating that complexity is part of the hard part because you don't want to do things that are going to harm yourself economically or anything else.、Um, so that, that's the first question. On this idea of US China trade war,、um, there are very mixed views in Washington about this right now. I think in general,、um, there's broad support for the idea of the Trump administration getting tough with China on economics, but what that means varies quite widely. The president and the US trade representative, I think, are very focused on the trade deficit. And I think that's the wrong thing to focus on. I don't think the demand should be lower your trade deficit by God or we'll punish you, whether it's China or Japan or anybody else, Canada, you know, or whatever.、Um, the, 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 the more salient issues are China's unfair investment. Rules, its forced technology transfer, its theft of intellectual property, its state owned enterprises, its、uh, you know, subsidies、um, to you know, favored industries,、uh, favoring local, local competition against American and other foreign investors. Those are the kinds of things that almost everybody thinks are really a problem that we need to do something about. And frankly, there was some hope ahead of the. Uh, the, the G8、uh, summit that, or the G7,、um, that 
the, the sort of the biggest economies around the world could say, look, this is a problem for all of us. Let's coordinate all of our efforts and, provide, and present a united front against China's practices rather than just saying, hey, we don't like your trade deficit. You've got to get that thing down, uh, which is something we could say to any country we have a trade deficit with. And so the instruments to deal with these sometimes are the same, but the objectives are quite different. はいえー、それでは、じゃあの中国関係の質問をもうちょっと続けたいと思うんですけれども、あのー、今あ、えー、フォンテンさんは、あのー、我々対、われわれ対彼らという関係、えーえー、明確な関係ではないというふうにお話しされたんですけど、まあ、確かにそういうところあるんですけれども、ただ一方でですね、あのーえー、ちょっと私もこの質問にはあの同じように懸念を持ってるんですけども今、中国とロシアが、えー、大変あの政治面、外交面あるいは軍事的にもです、ねえー、関係を強めていて、まあ、エネルギーの問題も含めて、えー、関係を強めているんですけれども、えー、この,あの、まあ、いわゆる地政学的な言い方をするとこのユーラシア大陸における、えーまあ、一つのブロックがあ誕生しつつあるとで、えー、このことがですねあのつまり、まあ、リベラルな我々の、えー、世界にとっては、えー、非常に、えー、重大な意味を持つと思うんですけどもこれについて、えーえー、政権内ではあ何かあどういったああの考え方が取られているのか、えーまあ、質問をされている方はあのトランプさんはあこれを知っているのかというふうに質問されていますけどおそらくトランプさんはそういうことについてはあまり知っていないだろうなということなので、まあ、ちょっとアメリカのトランプ政権の中でこの問題をどういうふうに捉えているかそしてどうやって対応していくつつもりなのか、何かウエッジですね。つまり草あのあれですね。くさびくさびかくさびを打ち込むようなことをやろうとするのかどうなのか、えー、ですね。それからもう一つあの中国の関係ではこれはまああのアメリカからあの政権に関係している方があるいは元政府高官の方々と必ず出る質問がであるんですけどもトランプ政権ということで、えー、トランプさんはどうなのかなということなんですけど、えー、尖閣アイランズにおけおいてでですね、イマージェンス、まあ、緊急事態、まあ、有事が起きたときに、えー、日米安全保障条約に,に従って、in compliance with the Japan US Security Treaty で、would the Trump send troops to 尖閣という質問ですね。Easy questions, thank you very much.、Um, On this question of a Chinese Russian bloc, I don't actually agree that there's a bloc、uh, forming. I think that there's a party of no that is formed between the Chinese and Russians. They can agree that they don't want to see、uh, an, an international order dominated by the United States. They want to see a world that is safer for their forms of political systems and things like that.、Um, they can team up the vote no against things in the UN Security Council. They can do showy joint exercises in the South China Sea and sort of tell everybody about it.、Um, but when it comes to actual, real, meaningful activity, I don't see a lot of、um, Russia China bilateral activity. Now, that's my view. You asked about the Trump administration's view, and I think from my conversations, the view in the administration is quite mixed. There are people who genuinely do worry about what you described, which is, you know, it's, it's hard enough to worry about、uh, a world in where China is growing stronger and has an agenda different from ours,、um, or a Russia that has a, an agenda quite different from ours. The worst case outcome is if they ganged up against us.、Um, and so, what do you do about that? You know, some people have floated this idea of kind of the reverse Kissinger. You know, Kissinger opened relations to China so as to balance against the Soviet Union. Now we've got to be friendly to Russia in order to balance against China. I don't see it,、uh, really.、Um, it's hard for me to see、uh, what, at first, I just don't see the kind of alignment that,、um, that, that people fear. Could happen, but I just don't see it yet. And then, you know, if we did sort of pull Russia to our side, I don't see really what we gain from that. And I can see a lot of downsides to it.、Um, so that's, that's kind of my view on, on the China Russia question. So, of all the things that kind of, you know, keep me up at night, the idea of a, a unified China Russia bloc faced off against the United States is not, not near the top.、Um, on the Senkakus, 
I don't speak for the U.S. government, uh, obviously, um, so I don't know whether the United States would, uh, what it would do, um, or whether that would depend on exactly what the circumstances involved were, but I would say if I was sort of forced to choose, I think the United States would um, abide by the uh, commitments inherent in the U.S.-Japan um, security agreement, um, but that's, that's just me saying this. はい、えー、それではじゃあ,あ次には北朝鮮朝鮮半島情勢、えー、に移りましょうか、えー、あ、澤先生今おっしゃったようなことであの本店さんおっしゃったようなことでなんかコメント付け加えることありますかありがとうございます、まあ、先ほど申し上げた聞いた話でもあるんですけどもインドの位置づけがあとユーラシア大陸の安全保障という点からすると大事かなというふうに思っていまして。あのまあ、先ほどちょっと十分にお答えいただけなかったところもあるので、まあ、そういった中国とロシアに加えてインドを入れて、えー、こうどういうふうに物事を考えればいいのか特にインドは本当にこちら側に来れるのかそれともやはり中印、えー、またはインド関係というものを重要視して動いていくのかそのあたりについてどういうふうにお考えになっていますか。Um, one of the great, uh, success stories. I think over the past 20 years or so, starting with the end of the Bill Clinton administration through all the subsequent ones、uh, in the United States, has been a sustained focus on trying to grow closer、uh, ties, security especially, but also diplomatically and economically between the United States and India, with the idea that there may not be an immediate payoff for these kinds of things, but if we are really seeing a power realignment in the broad Indo Pacific region, it would be better for India to be closer to us than closer to anyone else. Um, I don't think you're going to see India on our side and against some other side. You know, India's,、uh, Indians will often describe their foreign policy still, after all these years, as non aligned. I think the better description is probably multi aligned. They have different forms of alignment with different countries. And so the way that they would like to align、uh, economically, for example, with China. Uh, and diplomatically、um, with Japan is quite different than what it would like to do with the United States, but it wants to keep many options open. So at no point would, for example, the United States and Japan be able to sort of draw a line and say, China's on that side, all right, India, you have to choose. You're either with us or you're with them. They won't do it.、Um, and so it's a more subtle process than that where we find areas to cooperate. And to build up the strength of India so that it has a more subtle kind of balancing、um, effect、uh, over the long run. It's kind of less satisfying in a way、uh, than, again, the sort of stark、uh, difference in the Cold War. You could say you're either in one column or you're in the other column, but I think that's where we are. はい、えー、それじゃあ、朝鮮半島情勢ですけれども、あのえー、っとですね、あのフォンテンさんは先ほどの,あのお,お話の中で、えー、つまりホスティリティあつまり敵対的なあ関係に、えーまあ、戻る可能性があるというふうにおっしゃっていて、まあ、それはあの可能性はあるんだと思うんですけれどもただその、えーまあ、あのフォンテンさんもおっしゃったそのおキム・ジョンと恋に落ちた。とというような表現とかですね、えーまあ、あのキム・ジョン自身も、えー、アメリカとの軍事的な緊張関係に戻りたいとはおそらく思っていないであろうと思うんですよね。えー、ということになるとつま,りホスあのつまり敵対的な関係に戻るというその選択肢がもはやこれまでの動きの中でその選択そのオプションが封じられてしまっているんではないかとこれはまあ日本からすると軍事的緊張戦争は困るからそれは良しとすべきという考えもあるでしょうけどしかしそれではプレッシャーがないので全く北朝鮮ペースで非核化もあるいは他の問題も進まないと。ということで、えーえーまあ、なかなかあの判断が難しいところなんですけれどもその、えー、緊張関係軍事的敵対関係に戻るという可能性が本当にあるというふうにお考えでしょうか
、えー、そしてトランプさんがですねそこのところにまた戻って、えー、ネジを巻いて、えー、やるということそういう、えー、心意気決意がトランプさんに本当にあるのかどうなのかというのがあの質問それは私の質問です。それからあと、えーえーえー休戦協定ですね、終戦宣言、休戦協定、それから平和協定という、まあ、平和条約という動きがあります、朝鮮戦争のですね。で、これが動いていくと、在韓米軍がですね、の見直しがどの程度進むのか、撤退する。とということになる可能性があるのかどうなのか、えー、ということですね、えーまあ、この2つの質問をまずお願いしたいと思います。I think the president could fall out of love、uh, with Kim Jong-un, and I think that could happen、uh, quickly at some point, and I think that would change the entire tenor.、Uh, look how quickly we went from Um, talk about Rocket Man and at the UN a year ago completely destroying North Korea to a quite warm、uh, summit in Singapore. These things move fast、uh, given、uh, the nature of the leaders、uh, on both sides, I think.、Um, and I, can, I, I agree that, that North Korea probably doesn't want to resume a hostile policy anytime soon, but the difference is. The United States, and I think Japan for that matter, are focused on the end game of this process. How are we actually going to get denuclearization? North Korea is focused on the process itself. Once they're in the process, where the United States is not going to threaten them militarily, there's very unlikely to be new UN Security Council resolutions, the pressure that China and Russia put on them relaxes. Um, and they can start to haggle over what kind of goodies they get in order for moves on the nuclear front.、Um, that's a good place for the North Koreans to be fundamentally. But if that goes on forever, it's not a good place for the United States and the Japanese to be because what we want is this end game objective. We want denuclearization, and so far we're not seeing any progress toward denuclearization. So Kim Jong un can write. You know, artful letters to the president, and they could have another summit and all these other kind of things. But I suspect that at some point,、um, everyone is going to realize that if what we mean by denuclearization is North Korea gets rid of its nuclear weapons, it's not going to happen anytime soon, if ever. And if that's true, then at what point does the president say, hey, wait a minute, this diplomatic dance has been a lot of fun? Uh, but you know, it was the pressure that was really moving these guys, and that's when I think you could see a return to the hostile policy.、Um, in terms of a peace agreement, I've heard you know, kind of you know, worries about should the United States, you know, if, if there's a peace agreement with North Korea, then there's no rationale to keep American troops in South Korea to defend against North Korea. I would be extremely surprised. If there's any real movement toward the withdrawal of American forces from South Korea. First of all, it would be a terrible mistake, absence the full and complete denuclearization of North Korea. And then you still have the problems with the, the chemical arsenal and the conventional posture and the general hostility,、uh, which may subside under President Moon, but who, you know, there's just a whole bunch of reasons、um, why that would be a bad idea.、Um, and even if the president decides this is really what he wants to do, I mean, in a way, we've seen this movie before. You can go all the way back to Jimmy Carter, who campaigned on the idea that he was going to bring the troops out of South Korea, came in, ordered the national security advisors, Big Nate Brzezinski and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, to drop a plan for those withdrawal. And the Congress went crazy, and the military went crazy, and American diplomats went crazy, and guess what? They're still there. そうするとあの北朝鮮のもう一つ質問が来ていてです、ねえー、ということはあのアメリカはあ核兵器を持った北朝鮮はあの絶対認めないと、えー、つまり完全な CVID という言葉は今あまり使われていませんけれども、えー、完全な非核化以外は認めないということになりますか。Well, again, you're asking me rather than you know, the President of the United States.、Um, 
Certainly the word irreversible has disappeared. Uh, if you look at the latest uh, US-Japan joint statement, they talk about complete and verifiable, but not irreversible. Um, so um, maybe that's a change, maybe it's not. I think, um, I don't know whether the, you know, President Trump would ultimately accept a deal that was short of full denuclearization in North Korea. I mean, obviously that's not the stated policy, but you know, it's a negotiation. I personally think it would be a huge mistake to, I mean, here, here's one variant of what you could imagine would be appealing to some folks. Uh, you get some significant reduction in the nuclear arsenal in North Korea, and you get a complete elimination of all of its ICBMs. So therefore, North Korea is no longer a physical threat to the United States, or at least the continental United States, because it can't launch nukes there. Well, that would, I think, be a major problem for Japan, which would still be vulnerable to short and medium range missiles and the remaining nuclear arsenal, not to mention conventional things, and, and, our, and our South Korean ally as well. Um, that's, that, that would be an approach, I think, that would really be damaging um, if, if, you know, for America's standing in, in Northeast Asia, among other things and the messages that we send, not just to North Korea, but to China and others, about really what it is that, that the United States values, whether it values a, re, a safe and stable regional security order, or whether it values kind of a fortress America approach to these kinds of things. Um, and that's before you even get to how, you know, the Japanese themselves would, would approach this. Um, so I, I suspect that's unlikely. Um, again, we're in this world where anything is possible, and particularly when, you know, you have this kind of very personalized diplomacy. Um, but I would be very surprised uh, if the United States were to rescind its demand that full denuclearization is on the table. I think the real question is going to ultimately be denuclearization on what timeline? Is it, does the United States want denuclearization aspirationally the way, the, United, the way North Korea wants the withdrawal of all American troops and the end of the American hostile policy aspirationally? Uh, or is this something that we stick to this we will not lift sanctions until we see denuclearization. And that, I think, is the basis of the discussions that are happening with the North Koreans and inside the administration right now. それはあのまあデータの集積ですね個人データの集積の問題でこれはあの今あのフェイスブックはじめいろんなあの企業があまあいろいろ責任を問われるようなことがあの起きているんですけれどもあのこの質問はですね。つまり、データの集積に代表されるように、え、つまり先制国家、あ、あるいは独裁国家、あ、中国を指してもいいと思うんですけど、そういう国の方が、あの、民主主義国家よりも、つまり現代におけるパワーという意味では、え、まあ、
Um, I mean, it's on balance. Uh, you know, do you do do you uh, remove from people the ability to change their leaders, to know what the laws are, to be subject to those laws in an impartial manner, know how to change those laws if they would like to? You take all that away in order to be able to accomplish things more effectively. I think the answer is always no for those of us who live in democracies. But it does provide it. It, it is a challenge. Um, I think to some degree at the ideological level because one of the great things um, that the, you know, the free world had going for it in terms of the ideological competition during the Cold War was that you know, communism was a terrible political system and socialism was a terrible economic system and they fused these two together and so that over the decades, capitalism was always gonna be better and more uh, effective in generating sustained economic growth than centralized planned economies. And so whether you objected to the political repression or, or just wanted a job, in both cases, the free world was the better place to be. The question now is if China or other autocracies can generate growth rates sustained over a very long period of time that will be higher than those in you know, democracies, does that give autocracy an attraction solely on the economic benefit, uh, on the economic merits in which people will say, well, okay, look, I, I get the fact that I can't choose my leaders and I get the fact, but, but it's okay, look, you know, they deliver the goods, they deliver the economic benefits. Um, you know, that I think is an experiment that we're sort of running right now. Um, but it's, you know, yet another reason why I think it's imperative that as a, national security and foreign policy matter, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, that the democracies are all seen as strong and working together. And so that this is not um, kind of a, you know, there's this really effective China that may, you know, have its political problems, but, you know, compared to the dysfunctional democracies, it looks like the winner. I think that's a, that's a, that's a bad environment for us to be in. Yeah, え、ああ、Sure. Um, well, you know, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, um, he speaks up, I think, all the time and has conversations with the president, multiple conversations every week. And uh, the way he's articulated the case for democracy um, and the rule of law and liberal values is very articulate as recently as a few weeks ago when I, when I heard him do this. So that's one example. Um, uh, you know, I think, um, I think there's, you know, Mike Pompeo, the new Secretary of State, who came over from Central Intelligence Agency, I think um, can quite often be a, another example of this. I mean, you know, the State Department is more involved in some of the democracy issues than was the case even under Rex Tillerson, his predecessor. Um, and, I mean, you know, the issue here is that there's, um, there's no sort of abstract answer to some of these questions. I mean, you know, so much. So you take President Trump, for example, and and uh, and and folks will say, um, you know, well, he he likes dictators and doesn't really care about democracy, but yet the entire policy of the Trump administration toward Venezuela is based on illiberalism, essentially anti-democracy. Uh, Cuba is a complicated situation, but at least it's rhetorically premised on a lack of democracy. Uh, when they talk about Iran, uh, the U.S. officials often 
build their case on the basis of the repression inside the country and the lack of freedoms there and the lack of democracy. Now, one could always be cynical and say, well, this is just smokescreen for some other thing that they're kind of hiding. But I think, at least in, to some degree, this, this does run as a theme through um, the thinking of some of the government some of the officials in the Trump administration, although, as I think I mentioned before, overall the priority on the promotion of democracy and the promotion of human rights and these things is far less than it was in the George W. Bush administration and, and, and lower still than it was in the Obama administration. この数ヶ月アメリカの民主主義に対して中国とロシアが介入をしてきているとそれに対する警戒っていうのがアメリカですごく強く盛り上がっていると思うんですねロシアだけではなくて中国もとで中国の場合にはシャープパワーと呼ばれる力が指摘されたりまたはごく最近トランプさんも国連総会の演説で言っていましたけれども選挙への介入というものを中国がやっているようだと。まあ、実際にトランプさんがツイッターで示した材料というのはあの田舎の新聞に中国の政府のお金が入っているような記事が載っているということだったんですけれどもいずれにしてもアメリカの外ではなくてアメリカの中にどんどんと民主主義を言ってみれば干渉してですね民主主義の中に入ってくるようなことをロシアと中国がやっている特に中国もやっていると。ここうういいったことっていうのはアメリカを勉強してきたものからするとアメリカの理念そのものを踏みにじるような行為であってこう非常に強い怒りというものをアメリカ社会またはトランプ政権ですらも生んでいくような気がするんですけれどもそのあたりどういうふうに今アメリカワシントンまたはトランプ政権で受け止められているんでしょうか、well, the, um... The major one that's been a focus of the US public, obviously, is Russia because of the meddling and interference in the 2016 election. It's become very politicized in a very unhelpful way because there, President Trump and a number of Republicans believe that to the degree to which we focus on Russia's actual interference in the 2016 election, it undermines the perceived legitimacy of Trump's election and that. Democrats and others would say, well, see, the Russians got him elected, otherwise he wouldn't get elected. We could have that argument forever, but the reality is that Russia and to right now a lesser extent China, but still an extent, um, have, are, and will be interfering in the democratic processes of the United States and other democracies too. This is about elections, but it's not only about elections. And so, uh, you know, What we saw in 2016 with respect to Russia was, you know, um, trolling and disinformation and, so and hacking and then the distribution of, you know, um, private information to help one side rather than the other, but also um, attempts to put cyber beacons in uh, electoral systems and voting machines and everything else. So it was really, an, and, and, you know, and other things as well, it was really kind of an across the board uh, attempt to medal in the election um, that really the government only kind of put everything together after the election itself or, or very close to it. The Chinese tend to be more subtle and if you look at, for example, what they've done in Australia, I think that is the test bed for what they could do in a democracy like the United States or Japan or one of these other ones in the future where, you know, it's not as, they didn't set up a, you know, a, a WikiLeaks type cutout for Australia, but what they've done is move on a variety of fronts that, you know, some of it is cyber means, but it's also the use of uh, the purchases by, you know, people and entities close to the government of, in Beijing, of Chinese language media, so as to um, constrain or influence the message that, uh, that, that, that those who consume the Chinese language media are getting. Um, it's, uh, control or influence over the Chinese uh, students who are at universities. Um, y you know, th there's a variety of different mechanisms by its, its use of, or at least the implicit threat of economic uh, consequences should, you know, people step out in terms of their criticism of China too much. So it's two kind of different models, but in an open democratic system, it's hard to protect against every possible vector against which an autocracy might seek to influence negatively the exercise of that democracy. 
And I think that that's why I think protection, whether it's defense of our cyber systems and 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 electoral laws, on that that's important. But more important still is the imposition of costs on the actor who's doing this. I mean, for the Russians. They got huge benefit in 2016, and they paid no costs in 2016 for their activities. Well, any human being would say, if you get lots of benefits and no costs, what's the lesson? Do it again. So until we change that balance so that the costs are higher than the benefits for anybody who wants to carry out these kinds of activities, we should and can do things to defend ourselves, but you can't defend everywhere all the time. You've got to impose costs. はい、それでは最後にあの日米関係の問題質問をです、ね、いくつかお願いしたいと思いますけど一つは、まああのおえー、昨日の沖縄の知事選で、えー、これをフォンテンさんも結果は知ってらっしゃると思うんですけれども、えーまあ、あの新しい基地を辺野古に作ることに対して反対している、まあ、玉木さんという方が、えー、当選しました、えー、この沖縄の知事選の結果ですねその、えー、これはその、えー、先ほどフォンテンさんが説明されてたこの日本のです、ねえー、役割ということで、えーえー、安全保障面で、えー役割がどんどん強まっていくというふうに強調されていたんですけれども、えー、そういう期待の一方で日本ではこういう結果も出たということなんですが、えー、この沖縄の知事選の結果と日米関係がどんな影響がありますかというのが質問です。それれからと最後の質問ですけれどもこれはこれ非常にこうなんかあの言うならワイルドな質問なんですけれども、えー、今後のアジア情勢、えー、そして、えー、日本にとって、えー、ベストのシナリオと、えー、ワーストのシナリオ何を、えー、フォンテンさんはあの考えてらっしゃるか。えーオーディエンスが日本人なのであの日本人を喜ばせるようなことは言わなくて結構ですからあの正直に、えー、考えてらっしゃるあのペスミスティックなことでも結構ですので、えー、教えてくださいということです。Um, on Okinawa, we've been talking about Futenma、uh, relocation for a long time. And、uh, so this is You know, obviously, another twist in the story and how this will be resolved, I just don't know. I mean, really, I think it's the question is ultimately, I mean, the United States can only influence or be involved in so much. I mean, this is going to be、uh, something that's going to be worked out between you know, the governor and the political opinion that he represents in Okinawa and the government in Tokyo. I mean, you know, and, and either it's going to be relocated or it's not.、Um, But this doesn't make it easier, that's obvious.、Uh, but what it actually means, I don't know.、Um, and maybe you can tell me what, it,、uh, what, what the outcome is going to be.、Uh, I don't know.、Um, in terms of、uh, scenarios, you know, when you, when you do foreign policy and national security, you always immediately can think of 20 worst scenarios and only like one or two best scenarios. It's just the way that the field is, I guess.、Um, You know, in terms of worst scenarios,、uh, or the worst scenarios,、um, you know, I think that,、uh, I guess there's two that sort of spring to mind.、Uh, one is,、um, you know, sort of economic and political dysfunction among the United States and Japan and the democratic countries、uh, of the region at a time when China continues to sort of go from strength to strength. And then you wake up. X number of years from now, and you're in a region that truly is dominated by China in a way that constrains the exercise of our democratic practices at home. The, the, the fundamental political way of life that, that we all sort of cherish as Americans, as Japanese, as South Koreans, as whatever.、Um, what exactly that looks like, I don't know, but it could be quite unpleasant given the alternative that we would like to see unfold. So that's one. The other is a war. Um, either on the Korean Peninsula or you know, with China, which、um, in either scenario could range from a tiny skirmish to something truly catastrophically dangerous.、Uh, and you know, the, as, as bad as things can get,、um, you know, our ability to、uh, defend, to deter, and ultimately defend if necessary. 
uh, a war, you know, a, a, an adversary like that is of prime importance because um, we haven't seen uh, wars the likes of which either of those would mean in quite a long time, and the, and the, it, they're they're bad uh, to say the least for all kinds of reasons. But that's the worst scenario. So why why pay attention to the worst scenarios? I, I, let's talk about the best scenarios. So um, you know, I, I think the best scenarios is. Um, from the U.S. and Japan perspective, I would love to see economic growth in the United States continue, you know, sort of more or less, and the global financial crisis be a thing behind us, and that Japan be, you know, economically and prosperous and politically um, sort of resolved, and the United States, we got a lot of domestic politics going on right now, a lot, and I'd love to see us kind of move out of the day-to-day -day craziness and and who tweeted what and you know what about this Supreme Court nominee and what about that and all these other things and instead um, take you know settle down a little bit in a longer term view so that we have an Indo-Pacific region in which um, I keep getting back to this notion of the United States and Japan and other democracies um, becoming stronger and working together more closely but I think that's the answer to how we keep the good story uh, that our countries have in the region going indefinitely into the future. And I think the chances of that are probably a lot higher than the chances of the worst scenario. So that's, that's what I'm going to bet on at least. Uh,